Hello and welcome back to Work Inspired. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer, and today's incredible guest is Ryan Simonetti, CEO and co-founder of Convene, a fast-growing tech-enabled hospitality company that's pioneering the future of virtual and hybrid meeting and workspaces. I'm so excited for today's very timely and relevant conversation. Work Inspired starts right now. Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, thrilled to have you here and to talk about what you're doing at Convene. Uh, really excited for today's conversation. No, uh, excited, excited to be here uh, and looking forward to uh, a great conversation. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me your professional story, kind of how you got to where you're at today and, and then what you're doing in your current role. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a Jersey boy, so don't <laughs> hold it against me, but uh, I grew up in, in central New Jersey. Uh, it was a a uh, big sports guy growing up, played a lot of basketball. Um, you know, my dad, uh, was, uh, an entrepreneur and has, has been a big influence in my life. So, I uh, spent many a summer, um, you know, working with him as, as a kid, uh, ended up going to, uh, Villanova university, uh, where, uh, I ended up becoming best friends with, uh, my co-founder for convene, uh, Chris Kelly, uh, had a, you know, absolutely incredible, you know, college experience, uh, was fortunate enough graduating uh, to start my career at Lehman Brothers uh, in their global real estate group um, uh, and worked uh, in their structured products team. Uh, so all of those nasty things, CMBS, CDOs uh, that uh, helped cause the financial crisis. I ended up working on a bunch of that stuff. Um, left Lehman to join a company company called uh, Gramercy uh, Capital. Um, you know, Lehman was an incredible experience, but I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. Uh, and you know, Gramercy uh, was really a, a startup uh, company at the time. And Gramercy's business was uh, to invest uh, in real estate. Um, we did everything from uh, lending to uh, equity investments to, to mezzanine loans. Uh, I think I was the sixth or seventh higher there. Uh, and in a matter of just a few years, we went from a couple hundred million in assets under management to many billions. Uh, and so uh, incredible experience to, to have at that age. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to get uh, promoted uh, and ended up running one of our investment teams. Uh, and interestingly enough, spent a lot, lot of time investing in office buildings and hotels. Uh, and when the financial crisis uh, happened, um, obviously, like many real estate investors, um, we went from investing to workouts and restructurings. Uh, and then I ended up kind of managing through a, a billion dollar portfolio of assets, um, including 600 million of, of hospitality assets. And you know, this was at a time where lifestyle um, was really becoming a movement. You know, you've got what Ian Schrager was doing. You've got W Hotel. You've got Equinox, uh, and what they were doing with lifestyle and wellness. And nobody had ever really brought that to uh, the workplace or to an office building. And that's when I kind of came up with the idea for Convene uh, in the middle of the financial crisis. Uh, you know, back in uh, in in two thousand and eight, and you know, knock on wood, thankfully had the courage to kind of, you know, jump in and, and start the company in, in 2009. Nice. So tell me about Convene. What, what, what do you guys do and how do you do it differently? Yeah. So Convene uh, is a hospitality brand uh, and a workplace experience platform. We hmm. uh, partner with progressive organizations uh, as well as commercial landlords to create what we think are, are truly inspiring places uh, to meet, to work, uh, to host events. And uh, we used to just do it physically. Uh, and now we're also doing it digitally. Um, you know, part of our transition through COVID uh, was actually launching uh, a new platform called Convene Studio. It's a proprietary technology platform along with uh, really a whole kind of production services layer to host, uh, and support virtual and, and, and hybrid meetings. Hmm. So I think a lot of people listening are familiar with co-working spaces where a business might rent out a part of a building, right. Or a part of a floor. Uh, and it's that shared workspace concept. And then I, and then most people know about convention halls and places where you can, you can book for a, a weekend 
you know, meeting. Is yours somewhere in between that or is it a mix of both types of things? How, like how does a business engage with Convene when they need some space? Yeah, so when we first started the company, uh, the core product at the time was really an outsourced kind of premium meeting event and, and conferencing space solution. Uh, and then over time, as uh, the landlord needed to do more from a hospitality and services perspective and companies were trying to offer more to their employees from a hospitality and experience perspective, we started to layer on a whole hospitality services layer where we would partner with the landlord and manage their tenant lounge. We would deliver food service and, and catering the same way that room service would be delivered in a hotel. Uh, and then about three and a half years ago, we launched uh, what we call Convene Workplace, which is uh, our flexible workspace product. So today the company, uh, we have 24 locations, uh, just about 1.3 million square feet uh, across six cities. Uh, we're uh, going to be expanding uh, actually internationally late this year uh, into London, which we're really excited about. And uh, of the portfolio, um, about two thirds of it is meeting event conferencing and kind of hospitality space. And the other third uh, is made up of our uh, of our flexible workspace product. Nice. And I want to get into what you talked about with the virtual piece of, of, you know, kind of the pandemic inspired and maybe I'm, I'm guessing you had plans as most of us did to become more digital and leverage technology better before 2020, but clearly it was accelerated in the, you know, throughout the COVID-19 situation. Oh, as we, as you look at your physical spaces, um, let's focus on that for a minute. What is it what does it seem like it's going to be for the rest of 2021 and kind of beyond where, where are you guys kind of shifting the physical space experience to be in a post pandemic world? Well, I, you know, the focus for us and, and I think many of our, of our peers is, is really about how do you bring people you know, safely back, right? Safely back to uh, a meeting or a conference or safely back to, to the workplace. So you know, our team has worked very, very hard uh, over the last year, including with, uh, health experts. We partnered with uh, Ron Klain, who is the former uh, Ebola czar, uh, who's now uh, Joe Biden's chief of staff, as well as our partners at Eden Health to you know, come up with what we think are, are industry leading uh, you know, standards. And that's everything from social distancing and kind of modifying the layout of our spaces uh, to uh, improving and upgrading our air filtration systems. Uh, all of the temperature checking and questionnaires that you have to do before you show up. Uh, and, you know, all of those things are, are now in place. And, you know, we've been, you know, successfully and safely, uh, you know, hosting both our workplace customers, but, but meeting customers really, you know, throughout, um, you know, the, the pandemic. Uh, our focus is shifting a bit now um, to think about, you know, what does the world look like coming out of this? How do uh, workplaces uh, and meeting environments need to change uh, and to uh, evolve. Uh, and I think we, you know, as a company, but also as an industry are going to learn a lot, um, you know, the next six to 12 months as, as people come back to space, uh, we get a better sense for how utilization is going to work. Um, you know, how, how often are people going to be in? What are the types of spaces that they need? Um, you know, we do think, uh, the future of work probably looks a lot like Convene. Um, you know, if we can work remotely and do individual work anywhere, the role of the office becomes different, right? It becomes about brainstorming and collaboration uh, and ideation. And, uh, you know, we think we're very, very you know, well positioned, um, you know, you know, coming out of this to continue to create uh, value for uh, your know, landlord partners and, and most importantly for you know, the clients that we serve and, you depend on us to deliver them a great workday experience wherever it happens. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I just sat on a round table this morning and listening to facility leaders make, trying to make decisions around the return to the workplace. Because you're, you're right, there's the safety aspect and then there's the beyond pandemic aspect of what is the most effective, productive way that people want to work. And as it relates to the short term with the return to work and the safety, it seems like there's it seems like when you get people into your space, there's a number of things that you can do and organiz organizations are ready for it. But especially in metropolitan areas where a lot of your spaces are, a lot of the issues are the logistics of 
public transportation to get there or elevator banks or, you know, just building capacity to get in the door. Have you had to work with commercial real estate partners or building built, you know, building owners, uh, landlords to, to kind of figure out some of that piece of the plan that might not necessarily be in the tenant's control? Well, you know, access and, and how you get people safely into space is obviously uh, you know, mission critical. We're fortunate um, in mm. a number of uh, our locations. We actually have retail access where we control the welcome experience and aren't necessarily dependent uh, on the landlord's infrastructure. But with that said, I mean, we have a number uh, of facilities that are, you know, uh, up in buildings that require our clients uh, and members to go through. Uh, a, a check-in process to go through the elevator bank. And yes, we've worked uh, very, very closely, you know, our operation teams with uh, our landlord partners and their property managers teams to um, not just come up with the right processes, but how do you make that feel as seamless and hospitable as, as possible? And you know, for Convene, what's always differentiated us is, is really hospitality and that experience. And you know, we always say there's a difference between service and hospitality. Hospitality is how you make somebody feel. Uh, and I think one of the challenges right now, um, you know, is with all these different standards, um, you know, how do you still make that experience and process feel warm and welcoming uh, and inviting? And, you know, that's an area where uh, we've spent a, a lot of time uh, and a lot of energy, uh, you know, trying to figure that out. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important. I mean, even as even as to the base level of just the psychological well-being, right? We used to talk about we I mean, we still do talk a lot about ergonomics and physical wellness, and then there's the mental well-being, but after something like this, everybody's got a different opinion and a different level of comfort and a different situation. So one cough in the office can make one person go crazy and another, you know, it's just like, oh, that's just every day here. So, uh, I I think it's really interesting that you know, companies like yours that, that deal with not just one team, but multiple teams across multiple locations, multiple different types of industries, hearing how you guys are planning for it is, is, is inspiring. Yeah. And look, a big part of this is just communication, right. Mm-hmm. And, and transparency. Uh, and, you know, I think that's something where we've been in constant contact with, uh, our, our team members, right. You're making sure that they feel, um, you know, safe, uh, you know, both, physically, but also psychologically, and then doing the same for uh, our customers uh, and members. And this is going to be a process. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, over the last couple months, um, we're seeing kind of double digit uh, growth week over week in our members and customers accessing uh, our workspaces at this point, depending on the geography and location, we've seen anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of our our members actually coming back to the office each week, uh, which I think is a really positive sign. And, you know, interestingly enough, I'm very, very bullish uh, on you know, meeting event and, and the conferencing part of our business. But you know, we've seen a 55 percent increase uh, in bookings uh, in the last 90 days. And, you know, most of our you know, bigger clients, um, you know, a large percentage of our revenue comes from your know, large kind of enterprise uh, uh, clients. Uh, you know, we're starting to see real demand um, in Q3 and Q4 for physical meetings again, and not just small offsites, which we would expect, um, but starting to see demand for larger, uh, you know, programs, uh, you know, second half of this year. And I think companies are starting to feel, and I can only speak for myself as a CEO in our company, you know, we're, we're getting on, you know, what, 14 months now. And, you know, if you're talking about the fall, it's, it's 18 months before you've physically been able to bring your team together or your clients together. Uh, and we do think that there's a tremendous amount of, of pent up demand and desire, um, not just by our clients, but by actual you know, team members and employees to want to come back uh, and connect with their coworkers. Um, and so I do think we will see uh, a pretty meaningful recovery come September, um, both in office occupancy, uh, but I think the meeting and events business is going to surprise people um, second half of this year. 
Yeah, we, we feel the same way. We're seeing the pickup. We're here in Labor Day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's good to hear, hear you say the same thing. Uh, in, in fact, I was going to ask you, you know, you've got, you've got locations around the country and congrats on, on the expansion internationally this year uh, and the plans for that. But I'm interested to know, we've, we've got physical locations in, in, in Illinois and in Wisconsin and the Midwest and then in, in Florida. And in Florida, it's a world of difference. You know, the way that the, the, the pandemic's been handled, the, the mentality there, it's just very different than it is here in Chicagoland. Um, I'm interested to know from either a pandemic perspective or even just a way of working perspective, maybe it's a, a, an approach to how things will be post-pandemic. Do you see geographical differences between your locations based on the way people have an appetite to come into, the, into spaces or to interact with one another? Well, look, it's a it's a great question. I'll answer it. I think kind of two ways. One is, you know, what have we seen from a response standpoint, you know, throughout COVID? And you know, obviously, all of our locations are in uh, urban, you know, city centers. You know, New York, Washington, Philadelphia, Boston, LA, Chicago. So, um, you know, interestingly enough, the the response and what we've seen from our customers has been pretty consistent. Um, across those uh, geographies. Specific to return, though, uh, surprisingly, New York actually um, has been bouncing back uh, faster. Uh, you know, if you had asked me that six months ago, I would have said, you know, Washington, D.C., or one of our, you know, kind of, uh, you know, maybe markets that was a little bit more, you know, south. Um, and we haven't actually seen that, uh, you know, which, is, which is interesting. Now, I know from talking to the peers of mine, Urban to suburban, um, and I think folks that maybe have you know a broader footprint in, in you know in Florida and some other markets have definitely seen uh, I think a willingness to come back uh, at a different scale and, and a different pace. The second question, though, is a really fascinating one, um, and and this starts to really tie into future of work. Um, and you know, we've been doing research on this uh, for a very, very long time now. You know, we've been at this uh, 11 years. And interestingly, um, our research pre-COVID and even coming out of COVID has been pretty consistent that people want choice, they want flexibility, and they want experience. And they appreciate great design. They enjoy natural light. They love great food. They uh, want seamless and frictionless technology that works. Uh, they want to be greeted with, with a smiling face. And so while I feel like maybe the menus design and the design can be lo more localized market to market, I actually think that most employees, most organizations really want the same things. And the big driver, um, you know, I, I think coming out of this is, is really going to be around choice where it used to be the employer that created the policy. And I think coming out of COVID, it's going to be the individual worker or employee that drives the policy. Uh, and to me, that means that this future will look um, different than it has in the past and will be uh, much more hybrid. I, 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 and I think that very much ties into what you talked about bef before with the kind of the bridging of the physical and the digital space, right? I mean, the one thing about the digital space, to look at this podcast, there's no geographic limits. We can talk to anybody at any time, anywhere in the world. And, and, and so if there is that appetite for a great experience, no matter where you are, I think that that's, that works well for creating a recipe for a post pandemic workplace in the physical sense, but a huge component of that of that has to be that you're incorporating some way to connect into the digital space as well. So your, your homepage says virtual and hybrid meetings, right? I, I, do you have any kind of recommendations for how, at least with convene that you guys are figuring out how to tie the two together to kind of create that seamless experience, whether people are in a physical space or somewhere remote? So we've been planning for this, this hybrid future for a while. And when I, when I personally think about hybrid, I think physical and digital, which is what we're talking about. And how do you really bring those two experiences uh, and two worlds together in a seamless, frictionless, and, and kind of magical way that creates a consistent experience, but also how do you bring them together to actually in, in, enhance the experience? And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the journey that we've been on, um, you know, not just the last year, but really the last 
four years as we've been um, really digitally transforming uh, you know, the, the company. Um, and, and thankfully, uh, you know, we had been on that journey before COVID happened. The second way that I think about hybrid, though, is really um, HQ, remote or virtual, and then a third space. Uh, and I, I, I think you, I believe you have to look at it kind of in, in both ways. And I do believe that the HQ will have to be designed and serve a different purpose coming out of this. Uh, at home and remote setups are going to become increasingly important. I'm sure for all of us that have been working at home, wrong chair, not great internet connection, screaming children. Like there's a lot that goes into creating a great at home work experience. And then companies like convene and others that offer third spaces are going to become increasingly important. Um, not just in city centers, but do they have to start to locate in different places, maybe closer to residential areas, whether it's in the suburbs or even um, you know, within within cities? So a lot to unpack, I think, specific to hybrid. Um, kind of doubling back down on the digital side of this, uh, you know, we, you know, if you look at some of the most successful brands in the world, even those in, in the physical space, um, they've been able to leverage technology um, to... Uh, reach their customers in new and different ways to engage them in different ways to allow them to interact uh, with their physical spaces uh, in a different way. And when done really, really well um, is a massive enhancer to the brand uh, as well as to, um, you know, the physical experience. And that's been the journey that we've really been on. I'd say the last four years is how do we as convene, although we're so anchored in, in the physicality of our business and hospitality, how do we become a digital first company? Um, and we started that process by really building what we call Convene OS, which is kind of our operating system um, that we built proprietary. That's really like the infrastructure of Convene. Um, you know, it's our inventory control, it's our payments, it's our CRM, it's all of that kind of core infrastructure. And then we had started pre-COVID to build some of these new digital tools, right? A new member uh, web portal, uh, a mobile app that started to kind of digitize the way that our customers could interact with our space. And then COVID happens. And for our meeting and event and conferencing business, overnight, you know, a $220 million revenue business goes to zero. And we said, wow, all of our clients now have to figure out virtual. And coming back from COVID, they're going to have to figure out hybrid, which is how do you have virtual attendees and speakers coming into a physical environment? And how do you make that feel magical for both the in-person attendees as well as, as the virtual attendees? And so we pivoted all of our product and engineering resources literally in March. We came up with a POC. We hosted our first hybrid event, I think, in April of last year. Uh, and then we embarked on a journey to build this virtual and hybrid meeting um, and, and conferencing solution uh, with the idea of, of using virtual as a path back to this kind of hybrid future. Uh, and you know, over the last you know, year plus, I mean, we've hosted hundreds of virtual events. Um, we've hosted a number of, of these kind of hybrid uh, events and experiences and you know, we think that that capability is going to become a, a really big part of our future and also a big differentiator um, where we're really probably the only company out there that has the meeting, the event, the conferencing, the vertically integrated services, and then at the same time has a proprietary tech and kind of production services business that can really integrate these hybrid meetings and events together in, in a single solution. So um, you know, we've obviously making a big bet, um, but feel pretty confident with what we're seeing. And, and you'll feel like the world is kind of coming our way now. Yeah, I, I, I think we could probably talk for hours on some of the tools and technologies and solutions you're implementing. And I'd love to have that conversation with you, actually. But uh, since we're, we're limited on time, I keep hearing you say the word experience, create great experience, whether it's in the physical space or the digital space. And you, your company has been recognized as a best place, a best workplace or a most promising company. Do you think that's one of the kind of the key ingredients is that you're focusing on just really delivering a phenomenal experience, regardless of where people are? 
Yeah, I mean, our you know, I think our our mission at this point is you know, is to create a, a a great day at work wherever mm-hmm. it now happens, mm-hmm. um, and whether that's physically or or digitally, we want to be able to meet our our customers uh, and users ultimately where they are. But to me, you know, um, I'm a huge uh, you know Danny Meyer fan, and when we first started, uh, you know, when Chris and I first started the company, one of the first books we read was uh, you know, setting the table, and you know, I think one of the things that's allowed. Um, Union Square Hospitality Group to be so uh, successful is that they really believe that hospitality starts with with happy team members and that your your number one customer uh, is actually your employees. It's your team. And, you know, happy team members oftentimes lead to happy guests. And, you know, I think we've proven that out for sure. Um, Over the last 11 years, um, we just actually were uh, voted a uh, best place uh, to work in New York again for the fifth consecutive year. And to me, that's, that's what I'm personally most proud of, um, you know, is the culture that we've built. Um, and, you know, that's allowed our team to really deliver a, a genuine and authentic, um, warm and, and welcoming experience to our clients. And when you combine that, which is like the soul with incredible design and, technology and incredible food and, and stitch that all together into kind of a cohesive and integrated experience. It allows you to, uh, you know, I think deliver excellence and, you know, our net promoter score, um, you know, is, is 90 um, and your know, best in class in the hospitality industry is, you know, in the low sixties. So, um, you know, I'm going to knock on wood. Uh, we've got our work cut out for us, but you know, I think we've definitely figured out the, the secret sauce there. Well, congratulations on your success. Um, I have to ask you, I, I mean, many people in our industry in commercial interiors were watching the meteoric uh, rise of WeWork over the past you know, five years. And I know that your hospitality, you've got the digital component, but as it relates to the, the shared workspace, um, I, I, that that story is probably more visible now that there's a documentary out on it. I think it's on Hulu. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are familiar with that story to some extent, especially in the New York area. Um, have you, were you able to kind of take a look at that, that story, that situation and take some lessons from it or, 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 to, or some, some things that worked well? Cause obviously they had a lot of success and before they kind of had their, 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 their downfall a little bit as it relates to shared spaces in general and their future. Uh, it sounds like you're very optimistic about them and their place in the future workplace or the future work life balance, however you want to call it the <laughs> hybrid model. Right. Um, but any, any comments on that? Cause I think obviously that's a hot topic, especially in, in that industry. So one, I, I haven't watched the documentary um, and I probably won't. Uh, I feel like I had a front row seat for that um, literally since day one. You know, we started convening in, in 2009. Um, you know, obviously uh, we're already in business when when we work started uh, and had a chance to see, you know, firsthand, um, you know, what they did to, to transform uh, in an in industry I've got. Uh, many friends and, and honestly, I think some of the most talented people in the industry today and, and many of which are, are now out starting new businesses um, and, and doing entrepreneurial things, uh, you know, they you know, sometimes you got to give credit where credit is due. And, and despite some of the bad decisions that were made and I think really a lot of dynamics around a specific personality, the fact is they transformed an industry. Um, there has never been a company that I know of that has designed, built and opened that much space that fast ever. Um, and granted they spent many billions of dollars of doing it, but you know, to me, uh, there was a lot to learn, um, you know, kind of seeing that play out. Some of the lessons where, you know, I think we took a very different approach was one, you know, we're a premium brand, right? We're playing at the upper end of the market the complexity of delivering premium when you vertically integrate all the services the way that we do from food and beverage to on-site concierge services, to technology, to digital, you really, it's not possible to move at that speed, right? And so by being a premium brand, to some extent, we had a natural governor on the business where 
you know, I always say, you know, growth for growth's sake is a very dangerous business. And, you know, I think convene, um, you know, we've opted for, uh, you know, a little bit of a more thoughtful, pragmatic, smart growth. I mean, we've grown incredibly quickly. I mean, I think our average revenue growth pre-COVID was almost 50% year over year, which is extremely quick. Um, but we've just been a little bit more deliberate, uh, I think, and thoughtful in the way that we ultimately, um, you know, built the platform. And, uh, you know, to me, that was just, you know, I think a difference in, in, in strategy and approach. Um, you asked the second question around, I think, the future of, of shared space and, and where do I see things going uh, at a more macro industry level. Uh, I'd say there's a couple trends to, to keep an eye on. Um, one is, and we're seeing this already, the lines between shared space provider, flex provider, co-working provider, and building manager, property manager, blending, right? Where it's becoming much more integrated. And I see that that will continue where you'll see companies like us delivering more and some of the legacy property management companies figuring out how do they add this type of service and capability uh, you know, to, to what they're doing. Um, the second is consolidation. Uh, I do believe that you will see consolidation uh, within the sector. We're starting to see some of that uh, already where, you know, scale, um, I think, becomes important, uh, you know, both from a financial perspective, uh, a go-to-market perspective. Um, and as part of that scale, you know, I think you'll see bigger platforms have multiple brands and multiple offerings that speak to unique customer sets, not too dissimilar from, uh, the hotel industry. And then I think the biggest thing to keep an eye on is how does the design of these spaces ultimately have to change moving forward? You know, is the same box type or store format, however you want to think about it, that was relevant in 2017, 2018, 2019, is that relevant in 22, 23, 2024, or do the spaces and experiences have to evolve because what people are going to come to those spaces to do may be different. Meaning it might look a lot more like convene than it does a traditional service office company with tons of private offices, et cetera, et cetera. And that to me, um, the data and the customer will guide the industry um, ultimately to where that needs to be. But those are like four big things that, you know, at least I'm, keeping it, uh, paying attention to it at a kind of a macro level. Incredibly well said. And I completely agree with all four of those. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to wrap it up with one question. Um, and it's something we ask each guest, uh, if you were retiring today and you've got a long way to go, you've got a lot ahead of you and I'm excited to follow so. your, your, your trajectory, <laughs> but let's say you're, you, you, you are, you're, uh, heading for retirement. What would you tell your team members, anybody that you're mentoring? What's a, a piece of advice you'd leave behind? Um, there's a, a couple. I'd say the first, um, you know, to anyone that is uh, entering, you know, the workforce um, is to work with people you like, respect, and trust um, that you know, push you to be uh, a, a better version of yourself. Um, I think it's so incredibly important, and there, I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for, you know, the people that I was fortunate enough to, to work for, especially when I was, was uh, younger in my career and, and all the mentors that I've had um, in particular throughout the convene, uh, you know, journey uh, and, uh, and, and process. Um, so I think that that's a really um, important thing. And as part of that is, is not to be afraid uh, to ask for help. Um, you know, I think there's a certain, uh, you know, insecurity sometimes when we, need to lean on somebody else, whether it's for advice or, or support. And, you know, what I found is that, you know, um, most great leaders or great managers or a great boss that you work for your mentors, um, they really do care genuinely, uh, and, and want to see you be successful. And, you know, oftentimes all you have to do, um, is, is ask. Uh, and then I'd say, you know, for leaders out there, um, especially having, you know, I think, had to lead convene through the last uh, year plus. And, you know, for anyone in our industry as, 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 as well as others, you know, this has been, you know, as tough as anything that I've ever gone through um, in, uh, in, in my career. 
uh, I would say to find this balance of eternal optimism with a blunt realism and leading through crisis, you, you have to have a foot in optimism and a foot in realism and it's really hard to, to find that balance. Um, and, you know, I think what I learned about leading through crisis, um, which may or may not be relevant for people that are going to listen in is, is really kind of, you know, three things. Um, one, accept reality. Uh, even if it's uh, one that is hard to accept and or acknowledge. Uh, the second is plan for the worst and make decisions based on that. And, you know, I think the fact that we had to make those tough decisions, but did um, really is why we're still here and in the position that we are. Uh, and then the last is have the courage to act. Um, and, you know, the courage to act, I think that's for whether you want to start a business, whether you're a leader that has to make a tough decision, or if you're in your career, um, you know, having the courage to act, uh, I think is, is another one that I would, a little pearl of wisdom that I'd probably, uh, leave. It's great. Great advice, Ryan. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I mean, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys, uh, come up with and as, as you guys grow in the, in me the too, years ahead, months too, ahead, George. months ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been, this has been a really, really great. Yeah. A lot, the, a lot of what you're talking about is are the same conversations that, most of the business leaders we talk to are, are, are contemplating, are questioning, are talking about. So thanks for sharing your perspective and your insight today. It's been great having you on the show. George, thank you so much. Uh, really uh, appreciate it and, uh, and hope your viewers uh, enjoy what was a great conversation. So uh, I really appreciate the time and, and thanks again for having me on the show. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.